What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. The action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the World Economic Forum's Dialogue on Nature Positive Land Transition. I'm really excited about today's topic because it is such an important topic for all of us. Those of us involved in conservation, in business, in civil society, in government, indigenous peoples. Um, if you eat, this topic is of relevance to you. If you care about nature or our planet, this topic is of uh, relevance to you. So here's the shocker, um, at least it was for me, and I'm pretty sure it would be for the audience as well. Uh, the demand for agricultural commodities has grown twice as fast as the world's population. So if you really ask yourself, you know, where is population growth really having a bite on the planet? It would be on agricultural commodities and the, the demand uh, for agriculture, the demand for food, and clearly the way we're dealing with it, which is piecemeal, we're trying to protect on one side, we're trying to grow on the other side, um, cannot continue uh, in the same way. If it does, we know where we will end up. We will end up in a huge deficit for nature. The biggest shocker for me for, from the IPCC report that came out recently, which really took its gloves off and the scientists finally sort of spoke in plain language to power. Uh, the narrow window we still have, and it is a narrow window, to achieve a livable planet, a 1.5 or even a 2 degree future for, for our planet, that is only possible if nature is essentially left untouched. So the big assumption, the big assumption of the ICC report is that nature, what you see outside, whether it's your local park or a, a farm or, frankly, uh, intact tropical forest, those all would be left untouched. And we know clearly that is not true. This uh, session that you're going to hear today is supported by the Food and Agricultural Commodities and Trade FACT, F-A-C-T, dialogue. And it's taking place in the lead up to COP26. I want to highlight a recent report that the World Economic Forum and the Tropical Force Alliance, TFA, 
put out this week that highlighted the significant loss of primary forests, which we all know really contain, um, contain our future because of the amazing rich stores of carbon that they contain, that if lost cannot be recovered in a human relevant time scale, and of course, biodiversity, the engine of life. An area exceeding 60 million hectares has been lost since 2002. This despite all the efforts of government, of civil society, and of companies. Um, so, uh, let me just say it this way. You know, I was born in the city. I was born in Sri Lanka, in Colombo. And for us, going out to the farm meant kind of going out into nature. And then we moved to West Africa, and we really lived in a tropical forest. We lived actually within a forest reserve. And so in my backyard, you know, colobus monkeys, uh, dikers, chimpanzees even were, were common occurrences. And then one day, one day during the, the growing season, it was gone. It had been cut and burnt and the following months, it was from then on out, was a farm field of maize and cassava. And that, for me, was the realization that all the farms that we see around the world used to be nature, right? So for us to come up with a solution to this challenge, obviously, we need to feed the world. Uh, and obviously, we need to protect nature. We really need a more systemic solution that can bring all parties together to come up with a systemic solution than a piecemeal uh, solution. So let me introduce the context of the session. This is sort of the overall context of the session. We are going to have a couple of amazing speakers um, here today who will, who will expand on this framework. And then we'll go into breakout sessions. And I really want to just uh, remind you of the objectives. Uh, of these breakout sessions, uh, try and surface the tensions and the trade-offs that are here, uh, get a sense of what strategies might be most useful, and then think about how we link food security, forest conservation, frankly, human migration, and climate goals through really this public-private partnership. Because I think there's general agreement that you need the private uh, sector, the nonprofit sector, and you also need uh, and also need governments. So we're going to start with uh, opening remarks uh, here. I need to do some housekeeping. So Slido for audience, Slido for audience interactions. You can submit your questions to speakers here. Zoom has an annotated function for breakout groups. Zoom top link chats can be used for interactions between participants. But please keep your questions to uh, Slido. Top link virtual raise hand. So use the raise hands in top link to ask questions or make a comment during the group discussions, that towards the end. And then please include your organization in your names when, you, when you're when you on to Zoom. This first part of the conversation, of course, is, is recorded. It will be made available uh, pretty much right away. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn over to Fabiola Munoz, who is the coordinator for the Coalition for Sustainable Production Peru, and is the co-chair of FACT, the multi-stakeholder task force, uh, to give us some opening remarks. Fabiola, from Peru, over to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, thanks for all the effort that um, the people is doing in this moment, all the people to organize this event, to do that. The world is changing and we are facing a pandemic and it is making rethink absolutely all the things, everything we need to rethink that. At the same time, we face the risk of the climate change and we have not yet been able to end poverty. This is one of the challenge that we have. And for that reason, there are some people more vulnerable than others to confront the climate change. And we need to think about that because the demand for agricultural products is growing fast, faster than is expected uh, in relation with the growing of the population. But this demand of food, it's really in relation with deforestation, for example. In a country like Peru, we have an increase of deforestation last year in directly relation with the pandemia 
consequence. People need more jobs. Government is thinking about the um, create of these new jobs and how we can um, help the economy develop a new economy. And this is true. We need to develop a new economy. And in this case, economy that is more inclusive for the people, indigenous, small producers, and we need to be faster in this. We need to work together. We need to uh, have the idea that the finance sector, for example, it's really important because the transition that we need, need to involve all the people. And we have a lot of poor people, vulnerable in different areas in the world. But the finance sector for that people, it's really far. This is one of the most important things that we need to discuss. How we can involve them, how we can make some decisions in the government, in the markets, in the production system that change the things, that stop deforestation, that help that people to introduce in the markets sustainable. And this is part of the challenge that we have, the transition of the land use sector towards climatic and ecological sustainability is an urgent necessity. We need to work together. And this is part of the effort that we are doing in examples like Peru, in countries like Peru, with the coalition or in the fact dialogue. This is one of the huge topics that we need to address. And in this session, we think it's a good opportunity to think about that. And this session, it supports the, the fact dialogue because we believe that dialogue is a key element between the government, the consumers, the producers, all needs to work on that. And uh, it's really important to uh, have the idea that the transition needs to involve all. And we need to be really innovative to do that. Thanks so much for this space. And uh, I, I hope we are going to have a good session today. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiola. Uh, so now let me turn to our panelists to really set the context or set the stage. Uh, we have three opening speakers. Um, uh, Malik Amin Aslam, Minister of Climate Change for Pakistan. Minister Aslam is unable to join us live because of a last minute unavoidable uh, challenge. Uh, so he will be here with uh, via a short video. Uh, Ellen Jakowski, who is the Chief Impact Officer and Head of Sustainable Impacts for HP Inc, Hewlett Packard Inc, and then Marco Lambertini, Director General of WWF International. Uh, so I'm gonna start with uh, Minister Aslam and have his video around it, just four minutes, and then we'll come to Ellen and Marco. Bismillah rahman uh, Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. I would like to start off by thanking the World Economic Forum for holding this very important discussion on a topic which is absolutely essential uh, for humanity, and which is how do we make sure that uh, our land transitions are nature positive? Because at the moment, they are not. We have a growing population with a growing demand on agriculture and a stagnating productivity in the agriculture sector. So what is happening really is that uh, at the moment, the agricultural lands around the urban areas are being urbanized. And agriculture is pushing its way into the forest areas. So this is a negative, uh, what we would call a nature negative land transition. And we need to get away from it. It is absolutely essential because of the times we are living in. This is the time when nature has really taught us a lesson. And it's a very important lesson for all of us to register and to digest. And the lesson is that we cannot be on this war path with nature. We need to get off this pathway. Because if we don't, then nature will react. And when nature reacts, humanity cannot face the reaction. Nature has, has its own way of surviving and of reclaiming its own space back. So when humans pushed the thresholds and went into animal habitats, nature has reacted 
through the COVID pandemic. And we have seen what it can do. So I think it's, it's very important to register, as I said, and digest this lesson. The other lesson is a positive lesson, which is that there is a new world out there. We can build back better. There is a nature positive recovery out there. And that is the path that we need to take. And I think that's what this discussion is all about, that how do we reverse the negative trends we are on in terms of land transitions and make sure that we have a nature positive land transition. Pakistan, on, on its part, has really learned that lesson during the COVID era. We announced a green stimulus for recovery, which was based on nature. It is based on providing livelihoods to the people and protecting nature. So two very clear objectives. And we have the 10 billion tree project, planting trees all over Pakistan, but also giving jobs to the people. We have the protected area initiative, which is expanding our protected and wilderness areas in Pakistan but also giving jobs to the people. And we have the Recharge Pakistan initiative, which is trying to use our flood waters, which is uh, really a crisis, but to use it positively and to use it to uh, restore our wetlands and recharge our aquifers, and also creating livelihood and jobs with it. I think that is the direction we need to take. We are also in Pakistan looking at a climate smart agriculture project, which has been approved by the uh, GCF, and it's looking at six, uh, nine districts in, uh, in Pakistan and looking at issues of water quality, water management, better information to the farmers about uh, weather impacts and the uh, you know, uh, rapidly changing weather patterns. And it's called climate smart agriculture, trying to use technology to make sure that our agriculture remains productive in the face of climate change. And I think we need to also talk about a nature positive agriculture. That is the discussion we need to have. Uh, I was recently at the World Conservation Congress where we discussed that agriculture areas uh, with certain conditions can also serve as protected areas, but provided they are meeting those conditions. And I think that is really the transition that the world needs to take so that we move, you know, we take a step back from this war path with nature and make sure that we get on to a nature positive recovery and a nature positive development pathway and a nature positive land transition is really central to that whole equation. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best for the discussion. I'll be looking forward to hearing back on this discussion as we move forward. Thank you. So I'm going to turn to the Director General of WWF, Marco Lamartini, uh, who's in Europe right now. Uh, so um, the minister said nature has really taught us a lesson. I want to talk to you about the destination. So when we talk about land use transition, what exactly, Marco, are we transitioning to? What does our destination look like? And honestly, you've been in this your whole life. Is this a utopian dream or is it doable? Your question, what is the destination? Uh, do we have a destination? Uh, that's actually an issue uh, because we have a destination uh, and very clear one uh, on the climate agenda. Um, the carbon neutrality, uh, uh, net zero emissions by 2050 uh, uh, is absolutely clear. In fact, it's a disruptive destination, a disruptive global goal that on climate, the world is agreed in Paris, that has um, disrupted in a positive way the old energy sector by driving uh, a shift uh, towards uh, a renewable energy. On nature, when it comes to nature, when it comes to forest, to ocean, to um, biodiversity more in general, we don't have that clarity. So we need to embrace a clear destination on nature as we have on climate. And um, you know, we've been part of the discussions before, uh, we are, and not just WWF, but actually a large group of organizations, increasingly diverse, uh, and also governments and businesses, beginning to embrace uh, the idea of embracing a global goal for nature, uh, equivalent to the global goal for climate. The double compass, uh, double North Star, double Southern Cross, that will drive our sustainability agenda. And uh, that global goal for nature is has to be, and science is clear about that, a nature positive by 2030 goal. What that means? Means that by in, 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 in simply put, means that by 2030 we should have more nature than today, more forest, more uh, uh, fish in the ocean and in rivers, more 
pollinators in our countryside and farmlands, more uh, biodiversity in general. Of course, we will have to develop proper metrics, but those are not the main obstacle. The main obstacle is to actually agree to the level of ambition, which is science-based, because it is possible, science is telling us, that we can reverse natural loss and go to a nature positive uh, track by the end of the decade. But we need to do a few important things, and that's where political and lead, leadership and will is key. The first thing to do is to protect more, protect more than protect today. There is a goal of 30% by 2030 on land and in the ocean. Protection, of course, through a number of different tools, governments, um, indigenous communities and local communities, uh, uh, governance uh, uh, of, of land and ocean, uh, private ventures, and so forth. And then there is the other issue that actually uh, the Minister of Pakistan mentioned already, um, the issue of greening the economic sectors driving natural loss today. Protecting 30% is key, but it's not enough. We need to also take away the pressures that today the economy, our economic model of today, is putting on nature. Uh, and, uh, and top of the list is agriculture, top of the list is fish, in the fishing in the ocean, uh, but also uh, because we're talking about land, uh, agriculture, infrastructure, forestry, mining, those are the key drivers today or unsustainable use of natural resources and destruction of nature. We need to green those uh, sectors. And uh, Fabiola is absolutely right in her in, in the introduction. Uh, the key dimension here is, of course, a mix of regulation, technology, uh, consumer behaviors and, 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 and changes in demands, lifestyle changes. But at the end of the day, if we're not going to be able to shift the financial flows uh, from where they're going today, which is subsidizing the wrong type of agriculture, the wrong type of fishing, the wrong type of mining, the wrong type of infrastructure, to sustainable, nature positive, carbon neutral uh, 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 transitions in all these sectors, we are not going to be able to become nature positive by 2030. So, so it, this it, is, in a nutshell, in nutshell the, the plan. And then, of course, translating into, into the ground is the next step, and I guess we'll be discussing this next. So even if, you know, we can't, totally see the destination. We certainly know the steps we need to take to get us on the journey. And it's important more than ever now to get on that journey is what I, I'm getting that strong sense from what you, you said. Yes, but uh, I would also add as uh, Joanne, I think, um, you know, we, we, we're at a point where we know exactly the nature of the problem. In fact, for the first time in, in our history as a species, we know the consequences that this is having, not just on the natural world, but actually on us, in our lives, on our health, on our economy. You know, the, the, the data are clear, the figures are clear, science, economists are very clear. We are, we're on a crash course uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as an economy, as a society. So we have to change. That's a massive change, mindset change. So we know the problem. We know yeah. and we need to f identify the destination. The destination is clear, carbon neutral, nature positive. That's got to be our compass. And then the transition is where we need to work on. Great. So I'm going to uh, introduce the second theme. So that first theme is sort of the theme of destination, where are we trying to all head to? And the second theme is really around, you know, forests, about restoration. And when you talk restoration, who are the restorers? Um, yes, it's nature but it's also people, right? And that's where jobs and livelihoods comes in. So I want to bring in uh, Ellen Jakowski, who's the Chief Impact Officer and the Head of Sustainability for HP Inc. And ask her, so how do we make sure that forest conservation, forest restoration, uh, the work we do for nature actually has positive outcomes for people? And how does restoration ultimately contribute to livelihoods? What are your thoughts on this? You know, link jobs, if you can, to this big effort that Marco has laid out. Because if you don't have jobs, we're not going to get, get to where we need to get to. Yeah, well, thank you, Sanja, and to the World Economic Forum for this discussion. Uh, I think we can all agree that healthy forests are key to the world's path to net zero. And you know, I'm from HP, a company who makes printers that use paper. So, you know, our vision is to be the most sustainable and just technology company in the world. And part of that vision includes making every page printed on HP printers forest positive, and that's for the planet, its people, and the communities. So thinking very holistically about our solutions and making sure that people, that humans are at the center of how we think about the solutions and implement them. 
And to us, of course, that means giving back more to the forests and communities than we take out. So some examples of how we're able to do this. Um, we're partnering with World Wildlife Fund to restore, protect, and responsibly manage 200,000 acres of forest in Brazil and China. And that's an area equal to the size of New York City, I think, where you are today, Sanjin. Uh, and with that comes positive outcomes for people and communities. So one project that I want to highlight in Brazil, where HP, along with WWF and International Paper, are restoring 250 acres of forest land in the Mogi Guasu River Basin. Um, together, we're working with a local forest restoration organization called Copaiba. And our work with Copaiba is a direct example of how we can ensure forest conservation and restoration that has positive outcomes for people, including jobs, Sanjin, to your point. Um, so founded in 1999 by teenage sisters, the all women organization has been working to reconnect and restore the South America's Atlantic forest, which is one of the world's most endangered, uh, endangered ecosystems. Copaiba takes a very human-centered approach. So it connects one-on-one -on -one with rural landowners to raise the awareness and gain permission to plant seedlings on their property. And the seedlings that Copaiba grows and plants themselves creates protective buffers for springs and rivers. It gives wildlife more space to roam. And just as importantly, it demonstrates the true benefits for the landowners and the entire region. Things like better water quality and in greater quantity, more bees to pollinate crops, and a greater shade to protect the livestock. So all of this work improves not only the lives of the community members, but also their livelihoods, you know, with focusing on that job creation, the sustainable um, achievement in the financial model of how we're implementing this, considering the community. So it's really this connection of people with people, people with the land, land with life, that creates a virtuous cycle of sustainable impact. And I think this work is a model for how we all need to think about the change we need to drive going forward. And Ellen, this land that you are in the process of restoring with the help from uh, WWF International and, the, and local partners, is that land still productive? So is there still some timbering that happens there? And my assumption is, yes, this is where it's being restored, but it's also going to continue to provide some amount of paper and other things. Absolutely. And again, I think that's the model, right? HP as a company needs to continue to create printers that will use paper. So we need to figure out how to do this, change that economic model, change the community model so that everyone wins, the planet wins, our company can still be productive, and the communities, of course, can also be sustainable in their livelihoods and in the health of the community. So, Marco, I want to turn to you on this. Right, so I'm going to ask you a very uh, pointed question. So when I hear this, I, I know you're a nature guy. Like, I know how much you, how passionate you are actually about nature. Um, this is someone who goes diving in the lakes in, in Switzerland to look for fish in the summers, uh, just to put, him, put Marco in a global perspective. Um, these are not just plantations we're talking about. When you talk about restoring landscapes and making them, but continuing to keep them productive, do they really have biological value? Well, look, uh, I think there are different types of restoration, right? Um, one clearly is about um, uh, uh, restoring a ecological functionality in full, which is uh, uh, possible and necessary in some areas. In some other areas, as uh, um, Ellen has just said, is a question of improving the, the state of particular landscapes, uh, uh, even rural landscapes. You know, there are rural landscapes that are now deserts in terms of uh, biodiversity and, uh, and, and actually is beginning to have a negative effect on the productivity of those uh, farmland as well. Uh, and with some interventions, uh, uh, very, very simple sometimes, just adding, you know, vegetation, wild, uh, native vegetation, uh, 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 the, the, the value of biodiversity of these places increases incredibly uh, quickly. So uh, there are different ways of restoring, and sometimes we need to go deep into full uh, restoration and natural habitats. In other cases, could be uh, more anthropogenic habitats that are still uh, able to host much more biodiversity uh, than, than today. Uh, but, you know, I go back to the point I made earlier. I think in order to allow that to happen, we need um, some, uh, both some system change at the top level 
level, for example, subsidies policies, tax and incentive policies at the country level. And then, of course, what we need is good land use planning uh, uh, at the local level. That's really the biggest challenge we're facing in our job in trying to make this happen on the ground everywhere in the world. Good land use planning, good balance between protection, production, sustainable production, and, and, and sustainable user resources, uh, where nature and people both benefit. And that requires you know, good governance <laughs> on the ground and, and a multi-stakeholder and a willingness to bring really all the stakeholders together. Um, so Ellen, that's the way, the way the challenge is, really, I think. Yeah. Ellen, let me just turn to you. You know, not a week goes by now that we at Conservation International don't hear from a company that is interested in some type of restoration, whether it's ocean restoration, mangroves, uh, forest, grasslands, right? We're doing something with carrying on grasslands, for example, in South Africa. It's like literally every week. Why is it so attractive for, for the private sector? And would you, and the second part of that question is, would you also agree, right? The private sector has the fuel to keep this going, but you need good policies on the government level to put that within a framework that is actually scalable. Sure. Well, I think, you know, you're in New York where the United Nations General Assembly is convening and the world is is wrestling with how do we accelerate our actions to tackle climate change and all of the other societal pressures that we're facing. So it's time to act. Companies, again, like HP, need to step up and change what we are doing and help influence what others are doing and bring them along with us. And so I think, you know, the conservation effort um, and the, the number of phone calls you're getting uh, indicate the, the interest, the strong, clear need, the urgency that we are all feeling as corporations and as individuals to change what we are doing to address climate change and make a difference. You know, I live in Northern California and all summer, the wildfires have been raging. They've impacted my life, my community's life, um, and, and we need to change. And so I think that is what you're feeling um, as is this impact of of everyone feeling the urgency to do things differently and better. Right, but it, it sounds like you're not just saying you're following your customers, right? Because you, you're not only, is, is, a, is a question, it, my question is, is industry, and let's just pick on HP because you're representing them, right? Sure. Is HP following the customers or are they leading them? I think both. Uh, primarily leading and trying to educate our customers um, to the opportunities they have as well to influence us, right? So when they change their purchasing habits, that helps accelerate our changes. We're leaning into it. For example, our PC portfolio, um, we've been able to substantiate the claim that HP has the world's most sustainable PC portfolio. So we're out there, we're ahead of the game, but that is a comparative statement. You know, our competitors could come and do something differently and raise the stakes for us, which is a good thing because then we have to raise the bar to keep that statement. So bringing our customers into the equation, they're part of the solution. They help push us faster. You know, we've set some really ambitious and comprehensive goals for 2030. And for us to meet them, we need our customers along with us to be part of the solution. Marco, uh, one minute to wrap up. Any thoughts that you might have? And then I'm going to move to the the breakout sessions? Um, well, the, the, perhaps the last thought uh, to, to share, it's, um, it's about really try to, I mean, our, the, our challenge is going to be uh, uh, achieving multiple wins at once. And, um, and I think um, what is exciting about today is the fact that the economic agenda, the social development agenda, uh, and the environmental agenda are really coming together. And uh, it's rare to hear any more uh, initiatives or projects that just taking one of those angles uh, uh, and not try to integrate the three. That's, I think, the most exciting development of the last few years. And uh, yes. we need to all work together in that direction. Yeah, I, I, I really would agree with you. I think the biggest thing that we've sort of seen, and you, you know, you and I have been part of the uh, World Economic Forum sort of uh, community for some time now, is, is both the inclusion of our agendas, conservation agendas, nature agendas within those high level panels, but also the other way around. Like I can't remember a panel that I have done, even the one I did this morning, indigenous peoples, business leaders, in this case from MasterCard, government sector and nonprofit, right? That's really a, a, a promising change to, to push for systemic change. 
Um, all right, so thank you to the opening panelists. Uh, I really appreciate all of your, Fabiola, for giving us a big frame, and then Marco, Alan, uh, Minister uh, from Pakistan, um, Aslam, Minister Aslam, for, uh, for giving us some context for discussion. So this was the recorded segment. It'll be webcasted after the session. Uh, to a, now we're going to move to a hands-on uh, working session.